And it's a pleasure for me to be the moderator for today's ELISA Achievement Celebration event. This is an event that aims to both acknowledge and share with the world the joint achievements of this unique alliance of nine European universities during the first half of its lifetime. The consolidation of the ELISA communities, the issuance of the first ELISA credentials, the launching of the ELISA community platform, and the joint ELISA call for interinstitutional activities. Nowadays, societies are facing many challenges, such as the consequences of climate change, rapid technological transformations, armed conflicts, and increasing social economic inequalities, among others. In this global context, there is an emerging need for higher education to take the leadership and be a role model of cooperation and engagement with society's problems, empowering individuals and collectives to take the path of action and change. In the next hour, we will acknowledge the steps taken by ELISA towards this path and the transformation of nine European universities according to this vision. It is also important to emphasize that this celebration takes place in the context of the first face-to-face -face meeting of the ELISA Executive Board in Budapest. Today and tomorrow, faculty members, staff, students, and representatives from, from the nine ELISA partners will meet here at BME to discuss the following steps and address relevant topics for the future of the Alliance. Some of these topics will be shared by the speakers of today's event. But first, I would like to ask the Director of BME, Mr. Tibor Cigain, to please open the session and share some words with us. Dear colleagues, dear colleagues, I warmly welcome you to Eliza Milestone event. Today is a special day in many cases. We celebrate the first thousand ELISA credentials given to those students who have effectively participated in the pioneer ELISA communities. This is proof of the joint efforts of the whole ELISA community. During today's roundtable discussion, we can recall the challenges of the initial phase of ELISA. We will meet the responses we activated to those challenges and the experiences attached to it. We will also learn how we can plan our future, about the next steps and the strategies set to achieve them. It is with great honor that the Budapest University of Technology and Economics can provide a venue for this event and critical discussion in the year we celebrate our 240th anniversary. The past two years, we overwhelmed by socio-economic socio problems to be solved. In 2020, due to the pandemic, we had to adapt new solutions to our daily operational processes. At the beginning of this year, 2022, we had to provide aid to students, teachers, and their families affected by Russian-Ukrainian war that broke out in our neighboring country. No matter what challenges we have faced, we could always respond to problems united with experts from our academic community. We can also clearly see that international cooperation and the adaption of diverse experiences have become essential tools for the development of education and research areas, as well as the transfer of knowledge and the birth of new services, products, and innovations. ELISA has also created and will create multi-actor and multidisciplinary co communities that seek to contribute to the solution of critical global challenges and play an extremely significant role in shaping our own BME community. The European Engineering, Learning, Innovation and Science Alliance, ELISA, was created with the vision to train a new generation of European engineers through the partnership of nine leading European technical universities. ELISA European University is proof that joint work can be truly effective to translate a unique vision into reality. In this ELISA reality, complex training and innovative education portfolios merge with the commitment to contribute to the achievements of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030. 
And this is also the goal of the ELISA communities and our university as well, to submit as many common project proposals as possible to the Horizon Europe programs. We are to constantly increase the number of ELISA communities to keep our alliance active, and right now the time is ripe to establish several BME-led ones with our community call currently open. I ask all my colleagues to take this unique opportunity and apply for the call that supports new BME ELISA communities from Budapest, Istanbul, Paris, Erlangen, Bologna, Bucharest, Pisa, and Madrid. Let's continue the work together and join our forces to achieve those goals. Thank you for joining us. I wish you a pleasant and effective time during the two days you will spend with us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rector Tibor Cigány, for sharing your thoughts about the significance of Eli Eliza's vision for the future of our university and Europe. What is the potential role of European universities in this challenging global scenario? How are they taking part in the undergoing changes? To give some light to this question, we have here today our first keynote speaker, Mr. Claudio Feijo. Mr. Feijo is a professor and the director for entrepreneurship at the Universidad Politecnica of Madrid. He is also the coordinator of ELISA Unfold, the entrepreneurship dimension of ELISA, a project co-funded by the European Union and EIT Digital. So, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And, um, you know, I come from the future. Um, yeah, uh, exactly I come from a possible future. And, and I have news for you. And from this future, uh, and this news are related with a new mission for universities. You know, we basically at the university we have three missions, uh, education, we also have research, and the third mission, you can call it innovation, tech transfer, engagement with society. But I'm going to complicate your lives because there's a fourth mission. And I, I'm calling this, um, this fourth mission technology diplomacy or tech diplomacy, in short. Um, I'm going to, to mention, I'm going to explain this um, new mission in eight messages. Okay? So it's slowly huh, unfolding. The first message. And, and obviously, because I work in the, in the field of entrepreneurship and innovation, I'm going to build on top of this. So you can see this virtual circle of innovation. It's worth to, to reflect a little bit on that. No? Uh, we universities, we are in, the, in this uh, lower uh, left corner hmm, where the generation of innovation happens. And from that point, hmm, uh, this is where we stand typically, and now we are trying also to help in the next step, that is dissemination of of innovation. This is uh, where companies, typically the private sector, but also sometimes the public sector, they use this innovation to get some competitiveness, to, be, to become more competitive. And then, if this competitiveness is uh, sustained for a relatively long term, this becomes productivity. And then it becomes leadership. This is only, this is, uh, this virtual circle is not only valid for us, universities that belong to the first uh, phase, maybe the second one, a little bit in the third one, but it's also true for cities. They are competing in this innovation game. It's true for regions. Uh, they, they do compete, and it's true for countries. This is, in fact, the plan for a country like China. So this is taken from that. And it's a bit too simple because when you achieve this, this last stage, that is leadership or, or sometimes even hegemony, so you are the, the incumbent, the dominant uh, player in, in, in a field or in an area or in many areas, you can use these extra resources for whatever you prefer. It can be more social, it can be more economic, financial, or it can be a little bit more, I don't know, military, if you are looking for dominance. But it's, a, but it's a circle, because once you reach this, then you are able to attract more resources, more talent, huh? and we are universities uh, always looking for talent, and the circle only enhances, updates, and, and provides a head start, a competitive advantage. So, first message, 
innovation and a bit of circling around innovation, where to keep in mind. But second message, there's a path dependency. It's, it's too complicated to, yeah, I'm an engineer, no? so I tend to put complicated diagrams somewhere. Um, it's, it's, I don't have time to explain this in, in all detail. But the, the important message here is this uh, circle of innovation, this virtual circle can be reached in different paths. In here in Europe, we go in the upper part. Uh, we don't want, at least this is my understanding, uh, maybe share, uh, we don't want any type of innovation. We want innovation who is respectful with um, human rights, human dignity, and also civil society, hmm? freedom, user human centric. Uh, and then uh, we have innovation. And, and we think, as Europeans, that uh, we can reach a relatively higher stage, this B1 in the picture. And there are other models. You have the a little bit US, uh, still ice model, uh, where is the private sector who pushes technology and then maybe part of this technology, depending on the reaction of users, is transforming in welfare for society, you know, this B2. And there are other models like the Chinese, where you align private and public interest, um, and, and then with this you try to, to reach different positions, maybe farther from us, maybe uh, lower from us. This is still, uh, the game is, is being played. No? The important message is not every type of innovation is the same. So there's, there's path dependency. There's, there's something that we can do as universities, decision, and also the way we, we educate, uh, conduct research as an initial step, and then we do innovation that is depending. Huh? Uh, we, we can take some decisions. Second message. Then the third one. This is where the future comes. I, I say I, I come from the future or for a, from a possible future because I've been living in, in China for seven years. I only came back to Europe uh, two years ago hmm, to, to, to be back at university no, with this role on entrepreneurship. And, and from there, I can tell you, this is already a fragmented multipolar world. This bad dependency, these differences in, in how to achieve uh, goals in innovation and through this uh, innovation to arrive at the, some level of society welfare or benefits for, for, for the whole of us is different. But it has, has already happened. This is not in the future. Huh? This, this, is, this is already there. Huh? And too long, uh, too complicated to, to explain in the slide, but this is, uh, this is basically happening. So this was message number three. Virtual circle, path dependency, and we are living in a fragmented uh, multipolar world. Multipolar world means there are different centers huh? and, and not uh, as, as uh, we used to, to live in a world where there was only uh, main uh, way of doing things, main center. So they, this takes us to, to message number four. So technology is a key tool, is a key asset uh, in this um, fragmentation, hmm? in this path dependency, in this generation, um, dissemination and adoption of innovations. So we are living in a world of geopolitics of technology. So technology is not neutral, is not neutral at all. And this means for us, universities who are focused on technology and we are using this technology to educate people, uh, do research, uh, innovation, that probably we need to take some position. Huh? No, no, no. We cannot uh, be blind to what is happening. So we can see this, no? how technology is being used to reshape uh, international relationships. There are, there are many examples these days. Probably the most obvious, the most notorious is uh, artificial intelligence. No? Everybody's playing with artificial intelligence to try to, to use it in, in different ways. Uh, if you move into technology that is being used for security, defense, uh, uh, position of governments, this is even more obvious. So now we are coming back to, uh, this is, I'm, I'm becoming an old guy, uh, old crocodile. So this is industrial policy uh, a little bit, but now it's even more nationalistic. No? So we are trying, again, to design some, some national champions and probably to try to influence the position of this. And the, the names are there. So you can find the names in, in China, Belt and Road, Double Circulation, or, or here in Europe, we are talking about our digital sovereignty. No? This is one of the, key, of the key concepts. And all of that revolves around this idea of geopolitics of technology. And also you have the example of, of, uh, of the US, no? basically. 
the important idea here is that we belong to this ecosystem as universities. We belong to this new geopolitics of technology. We are a key actor. Why? Because technology is a key asset, is a key tool huh, for this reshaping of international relationship. It means that in the, in the coming world, we probably will, as an economist, um, uh, I will say that uh, there are maybe 20 to 30 years, complicated uh, years ahead of us. Uh, this means a couple of generations. So we need to be aware that, that technology will play a role in, in this uh, balance of power between, between regions. So virtual circle, innovation, different paths, fragmentation, geopolitics, geopolitics of technology. Where we arrive, take diplomacy. This is, uh, this is the mission. Um, it's a mission that has an internal part and it has an external part. An internal part because we are going to educate these next uh, generations of engineers, uh, technologists, uh, technicians, experts in technology. So we should be aware of this increased uh, role of technologies. Not the world is not that it used to be. Uh, it's a world with uh, technology being used no? in this reshaping of uh, international relationship. An external, why? Because we are the experts on technology. We understand, just to, just, uh, just to choose an example in this uh, long list, um, standards. We understand how technology in a standard influences society. Why? Because we are the experts in technology. It's difficult for, for people outside uh, this technology sphere to understand how technology can reshape, uh, can, can be used uh, in, in a certain, in a particular way to arrive at, at, at a model of society, particular model of society that maybe is not uh, in agreement with our European values. No? And then you have economics, the coupling of value chains. This is obviously happening. You only have to think about uh, chips, um, semiconductors, microelectronics, or uh, data. We're now, as researchers, we need to to feel a lot of uh, complicated stuff about what, is, what, what are we doing with our data if we move this data between jurisdictions or cyberspace, or you name it. So, as I said, this is external because um, we need to, we are, we are the experts on technology and society will look uh, at us and will ask, uh, hey, uh, can you tell me how can I manage this? And also it's internal because our researchers and our students, they need to, to be able to, to, to have the knowledge, um, to, to understand and manage this more complicated world. And they need to understand a little bit about international legal frameworks and maybe uh, how the institutions and different type of institutions, how uh, they, they, they play a role and the challenge they confront. So this is the core of the mission. So now, what about universities? What about universities that they are looking, uh, they are a little bit international. You know, um, the optimum uh, will be that uh, we cooperate together. Single world, uh, single governance for the world, and we have complicated goals ahead like uh, sustainability or uh, global warming. And this obviously, the, the optimum solution will be everybody working together. Uh, but it looks like we are not there. Huh? And, and I, don't, I don't know if we ever will be there. So, but there's a second optimum. The second optimum is uh, maybe you do the discoveries, you do the research, but if we share this, uh, I can also use it and maybe I can find some interesting developments from these uh, uh, breakthroughs. So this is the world that we live in. This is the fragmented world where there is not the best solution, but the second optimum. And universities, we are experts in this because we are used to, to cooperate, to collaborate even with rivals. Mm? We are still hyper-connected. Huh? Probably we are the institutions more connected with others, even in, in, in complicated parts of the world, and we can use that. So, so maybe we need to change. It's not just cooperation that it used to be. It's a little bit about smart cooperation. And there are many examples, but even uh, with increasing uh, rivalry with, with China, uh, there's a very recent agreement between the European Union on a number of, of domains. Maybe we need to reflect. No, not everything is valid these days, but there are still uh, areas where we, can, we, we, where we can cooperate even with, with uh, serious rivals. And what about ELISA? What about 
European universities. What about us? So, um, because we are experts in, in this world of competition and cooperation, we are used to cooperate. This is one of the, uh, I think, achievements. I used to work for a little while for the, for the European Commission. And, and I think one of the big successes was uh, being able to cooperate. We are used as universities to cooperate. You, you want European money, you need to cooperate. Uh, you need to, to be together with others. Huh? So, so now we know how to do that, even if we compete at the same time, huh? because we want to be better in the rankings, but, but we, are, we are able to manage that. So, so coming back to, to economics, this idea of the, of the prisoner's dilemma, uh, the idea is, is basically if you don't talk to each other at all, this might end up in a, in a disaster. So it looks like we universities are the ones who can talk a little bit even with the, the, the rivals, I wouldn't say the enemy. So keeping this connection is what will avoid uh, a little bit or we try it, or maybe will contribute to decrease the chances of, of a big disaster. So we, we do have a role, and through technology, even more important, because it's technology through this virtual cycle of innovation which is going to, to reshape the, the, the balance of power in international relations. So, so we are smart universities, in a way. We know how to cooperate. Uh, we enjoy the means to do it, always modest at, at the university level. We always ask for more. And we are used to compete and collaborate in this global world. So, so let's use these resources. The examples are everywhere. And not only there are good examples everywhere, it's also that we have a long-term perspective. We are not so worried as universities. We are not so worried about short-term. Uh, uh, this, uh, sometimes when you look into, for example, into politics, there are day-to-day -day problems. But if you step a little bit um, away and, and, and take a longer perspective, you come to, to Budapest as, as me, this is my third time here, every 10 years, and you see the incredible, the incredible development. For sure there are, there are huge uh, big problems and in, in, in month to month, but taking, uh, taking this um, big view, uh, historical perspective, uh, there's development everywhere, and there's development in Europe. Huh? So, so we are, we are the, we are the universities. We can, uh, as university institutions, who have this historical perspective. And last uh, message, and with this I, I will finish, is, okay, and, and let's be practical. Huh? What, what can we do? So my proposal is, uh, let's, let's go in this direction. I'm, I'm not saying building. I'm saying going in the direction. Building, name, center of excellence, can be another name, but this is uh, maybe popular these days. On, on this idea of tech diplomacy in the, in the understanding that technology is reshaping uh, international relationships, and we, as universities, we do have a key role in this tech diplomacy. And, and I put a number of keywords in, in the slide. So, so I said uh, civil society, and I said uh, quality of life, and I said human-centric. Look, I put technology under these keywords. This is the important message. I didn't put technology for the sake of technology. This, this uh, for me, personally, this is what I think has seriously changed. No? There are other things more important than technology. And, and, and for us, as universities related with technology, this is an important reflection. And, and, and trust, uh, this is another key, important keyword. And, and there are opportunities. No? We can, there are areas where we can clearly uh, have an, uh, some leadership or, or a head start compared to others. And, and also, a final idea, this has already started. For example, with, uh, with the support and leadership of, of FAO, we are going to launch a course on, on, on science and tech diplomacy. This is probably in the, in the, in the, no, in the spring semester, no, so it will be in, in, in some months' time. And I think it, it, it is going to be one of the first courses in this in this topic, and also we applied for a um, Jan Monet chair on this area and has been granted. It's, it's not yet signed, but it's in the, hopefully in the, project, in, in, in the process of being signed. With this, we have not only the mission, we, only see, we also have the means, and also society, for example, the European Commission, is looking to us because uh, they seriously think we, ha we do have a role in this uh, new world of tech diplomacy, new mission for universities. So thanks so much.
Thank you, Mr. Feijo, for this insightful lecture. Now it's time to introduce the speakers of the first roundtable focused on giving us an insight into dimensioned ELISA achievements. ELISA Executive Director Sofia Dagiar, civil engineer and the doctor in soil mechanics. Fabio Beltram, who is a professor and the director of the NEST laboratory, the National Enterprise for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology at Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa. <laughs> and finally, Elisa President Dale A. Martin, former CEO of Siemens Hungary. Zagiar. We have mentioned how European universities can have a leading role towards economic and social changes. From your point of view, what is the specific contribution of ELISA and what are the strategic tools set by ELISA to transform its vision into action? Thank you so much, Blanca, for the introduction. First of all, I would like to thank you, uh, Rector Tigani, for welcoming us, Executive Board, to today's meeting. It's, it's really an honor and a pleasure for me to be here today at this celebration. And it takes really a, a symbolic milestone for the Alliance to be able to physically celebrate our common achievements. So uh, to start, I would remember a student comment in an in a, in a event that we organized in Madrid with students of engineering. And we asked to the student, what does it mean to be part of ELISA? And the student words were, for me, ELISA, it's not just the opportunity to talk about possible futures, but it's the opportunity to be part of the people that really acts and builds it. So this is really a strong thing that really talks to my heart and to my motivation of being here, but also to make uh, uh, it's, it's a sentence that expresses well the wishes and, and the mission of ELISA. So as you may know, European universities uh, is giving us an, a, a really important opportunity to bring together and to uh, bring higher, and higher education to a next level. This is the words of the European Commission for Higher Education. And really what the mission that was given for us and to link with Claudio's speech is really to boost European universities in Europe to be a driver of social, systemic and sustainable transformation. This seems big fancy words, but are three important ones that combine together and combining our common uh, uh, strengths as European universities, as individual universities, is really a, a challenge and a unique opportunity for us. So I really am happy to be here. So in this contest, uh, we are really aligned with the uh, sustainable development goals. And what we want to do is really to train a new generation of professionals that don't, not only have the skills, but also are prepared and have the mindsets, not just to have the knowledge, but to the capacity to move that knowledge and to transform it into real actions to face these global challenges. This is really the mission. So what are we doing to put this into practice? Uh, we have four important pillars. The first one, to develop a new model for European engineers this model of engineering is, of course, rooted and linked to society uh, in a single uh, accreditation at the European level. This is a really ambitious goal, but is a really important one for Lisa. Secondly, building also a common innovation and research strategy together with our project InnoCore. The third one connected to our capacity of combining our ecosystems and our entrepreneurship education. And fourth, and not the last, Elisa communities. So ELISA communities are in a way crystallizing all our common efforts and are proposing interdisciplinary mission-driven communities. And here we combine the efforts of different stakeholders to tackle the problems of society and of course bringing new opportunities for learning for our students and our academics. So teachers, researchers, citizens, ONG, public organizations can team together into creating impactful knowledge teams. So this is really important. And here, again, combining strengths and common purpose. And this, I think, is a driving force for us. And today, we celebrate the fact that we have more than 30 communities that 
have missions that go from tech diplomacy, that go to health in the city. They tackle topics from societal challenges to digital and green transition. This is really a great achievement for us as, as a European University. It's our first tangible uh, collective achievement, so I'm really happy to be here today talking about. So I think we are also here today to acknowledge uh, the ones that were pioneers and had uh, um, the generosity and willingness to take this step with us because it's not easy to take a step in which all the future is not already written and we have just the intention to build it. So this capacity of innovate is the strength of ELISA and I really want to acknowledge to celebrate the fruits of our uh, collaboration and of course invite each one of you here today and the ones that are following us on the internet to take this journey of us and to uh, join the calls and uh, our colleagues will explain a bit more of it. Thank you, Mr. Gear. Mr. Bertram, from your perspective and within the amalgam of innovative approaches to education that characterize European universities, what makes the ELISA communities and ELISA credentials stand out and what are their added values? Well, first of all, Thank you also from my part to uh, BME for hosting this uh, event uh, and uh, our meetings. Well, I don't want you to undervalue the significance of communities. In my view, this is probably the most innovative aspect uh, of uh, ELISA. Our universities do not need another layer. Our universities need ideas and tools that are new for the benefit of our students and for the success of our educational programs. Well, communities are one of the most important aspects of this. Uh, in the US, they talk about learning problem solving. We have a more elegant European name, communities. Well, communities are that. Joining uh, people with different backgrounds, different knowledge, different cultures, different languages to face real problems important problems. Learning how to leverage different cultures, different knowledge, different backgrounds to solve problems. All important problems today cannot be solved with a strong single discipline background. You need more, a more complex training. This is the ideal format uh, that Elisa introduced. And I think we should all be very proud that this is happening and that we are making this work, and that's one aspect. But there's another important aspect in communities, and that's what's going to be happening symbolically in a minute when our president uh, will uh, deliver credentials. Well, credentials are an important certification. Our students will be able to go on the job market saying, we come from a good university, but that we can do ourselves because we tend to be good universities. We I have a good disciplinary background, but I have something else that the others don't have. I have experience in facing real program problems, as I said before, being able to leverage from different cultures, different languages, different experiences, different backgrounds. And this makes the difference. I believe that our credentials will become an important asset to our students on the job market they will be able to prove uh, they are not only good engineers or good something else, but uh, that they have the ability to interact and integrate their ability with other peoples. And that's going to be the plus that I'm confident will get them in better positions and faster positions on the job market. That's why we should be all proud of this. Thank you, Mr. Beltram. Mr. Martin. You have undersigned on behalf of the nine university rectors, directors, and presidents of ELISA the first 1,000 ELISA credentials. As a symbolic act, you will now present the first physical certificates, the first four ELISA credentials, which are handed over in person. Why is this important for the student, students? And how can they benefit from joining ELISA communities? Yeah. <clears throat> so thank you very much. So much has been said already, but uh, I will try to summarize it uh, from my side, where I uh, really believe that the building blocks of ELISA, which are cooperation, exchange, 
and social commitment that these truly contribute to a more sustainable European society. Um, and towards these objectives, we provide additional, as has been mentioned, additional options for our students to move freely within Europe, meeting, sharing, gaining insight and regional awareness. That is a big value. And they benefit further by joining our ELISA communities to live, as we say, to live the ELISA experience. How? By sharing a wealth of innovative activities which are strongly related to the Sustainable Development Goals. And these community members, they create, they create solutions for challenge-based topics in two dimensions. One is international, so I show it like this, international is the one, and the other one is interdisciplinary. And this creates a wonderful, strong cupola, I would say. So, we recognize such active participation through ELISA credentials, which provide valuable, valuable certification, confirming the individual participant's capacity to transform knowledge into action and also to become actors of change. It has been said that during the last academic year, over 1,300 students participated in such activities organized by our 34 uh, pilot communities, paving the way for many further communities to come. So, today is indeed a significant moment for ELISA. It is therefore my great pleasure and privilege as the first president of this Young Alliance to be able to present these ELISA's credentials for the first time on behalf of the rectors, directors, and presidents of our nine partner institutions. Thank you, Mr. Martin. And please welcome the three students to the stage. Benda Guspop, who is receiving the certificates on behalf of BME students Jamia Habadni and Ali Jamal Mahdi, who could not be present today. They both contributed towards the Aliza on the Move community that aims to contribute to more sustainable and inclusive cities through mobility planning. Paulus Guta from FAU, who is awarded a credential for his contribution towards the Aliza on the Move community. Like the BME students, Paulus participated in an international seminar to develop innovation proposals around the multimodal station in Madrid. Flavius Dragoy from UPB, awarded for his contribution towards the circular ELISA community that aims to develop resources for an integral approach towards circular economy. Thanks again to Mr. Martin, thanks to Bendegus, and congratulations to Paulus, Flavius, and the 1,000 plus students who have been granted such a unique recognition. There is no question, the ELISA communities are the protagonists of today's event. What are their challenges and outcomes so far? Who are the people behind the scenes of these unique platforms? To respond to these questions, we are very pleased to present the video testimonial of three successful ELISA communities.
Hello everyone. This is Burcu from ITU. I am coordinator of the Elisa Open Science Community with Esteban Gonzalez of UPN. Today I would like to briefly inform you about our community and I am happy to be here and to have been able to reach each of you personally. Since it is difficult to manage everything on an individual or institutional basis due to the wide variety of open science elements and practicing areas, we thought there is a need for a bridge that will bring together researchers, practitioners, beneficiaries and people working in open science in and outside of the system. Our aim is to empower research, education and innovation through open science practices to increase efficiency and productivity in light of the European Union's open science policy. We want to bring together and work with all stakeholders to ensure society gets the most out of science through the policies, strategies and tools developed by ELISA to be part of the open science ecosystem. Hello everyone, this is Burcu from ITU. I am coordinator of the ELISA Open Science Community with Esteban Gonzalez of UPN. Today I would like to briefly inform you about our community and I am happy to be here and to have been able to reach each of you personally. Since it is difficult to manage everything on an individual or institutional basis due to the wide variety of open science elements and practicing areas, we thought there is a need for a bridge that will bring together researchers, practitioners, beneficiaries and people working in open science in and outside of the ELISA. Our aim is to empower research, education and innovation through open science practices to increase efficiency and productivity in light of the European Union's open science policy. We want to bring together and work with all stakeholders to ensure society gets the most out of science through the policies, strategies and tools developed by ELISA to be part of the open science ecosystem. One of the main activities of this group will be organizing events at all levels, workshops, information days, panels, etc., and to support open collaboration with potential multi-participant projects and, of course, other ELISA communities. We are one of the newest communities to join ELISA. Now we are on the ELISA Communities platform and during the RBA Symposium, we started promoting our community with a poster titled Openness in Education. We will mainly focus on how open science practices can support the achievement of the four SDGs these are quality education, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, peace, justice and strong institutions. If you are an academician, researcher, student, librarian or innovator interested in working on open access publishing, open research data, open research software, institutional repositories and open science-based research assessment methods, your contribution to this community will help create a culture of openness within ELISA. We are here today with the awareness of the strengths of ELISA, ELISA which provides us a well-structured tool, the support of professionals and a platform that allows us to create the best possible effect on our target group. Thank you, ELISA. My name is Trisha Sanchez and I'm part of the UPM Industrial Engineering Faculty. I'm one of the coordinators of the Health in the City ELISA community together with Patricia Sanchez from the UPM Telecommunications Faculty. Health in the City was conceived to address highly complex and interdisciplinary challenges in the health sector, such as how to efficiently address a pandemic at a global scale, or how to implement new paradigms such as personalized medicine. We think that universities and higher education can contribute to the challenges through innovative technology excellent processes and data analytics. Our community has three areas of action aiming to cover the whole health life cycle. The first one is healthy context, the second one is humanized and efficient hospital care, and the third one is telemedicine, home care and prevention. So far we are composed by, we are composed of around 70 professors of mainly from UPM, but also from other uh, ELISA institutions such as FIU, PISA, or PSL. Our professors come from different disciplines, industrial engineering, telecommunications engineering, of course, medicine, architecture. We are, of course, willing to incorporate new professors from other ELISA institutions and other disciplines. Of course, we have students, highly motivated and excellent students and uh, professionals. So far, we are proud of having created this vibrant community of people, of having organized activities of different kinds, 
such as seminar or, or specialized courses. But overall, we are very proud of our work and collaboration with different challenge owners, such as public administration like uh, Madrid community, uh, companies or hospitals. Thank you, ELISA Initiative, for giving us the opportunity to amplify our impact and our commitment to society. Hi, I'm Jacopo Pascolotto, member of the ELISA community for Energy Transition and International Exchange, and I'm here today to talk briefly about my community. So how did everything started? How is an ELISA community born? Well, for us, everything started when me and other students coming from Mimparitech, a technical university based in Paris, decided to join an event called FAFA about the collaboration between French and Germany, organized in collaboration with the ELISA community, which by then we had no idea what it was. Once there, our job was to create a presentation about the introduction to energy and uh, we soon realized that we weren't alone we were cited by other students coming from the FAU Technical University based in Erlangen which is in Germany and uh, during the whole length of the event we realized how much of a pleasure it is to share ideas among other young people that come from a different social cultural and uh, educational background after three days, though, the event was over, it was time to say goodbye, sadly. But we received the great news that Eliza... We have learned about Eliza's shared vision and its first big achievement. In the next roundtable and under the title Eliza's Next Steps, three speakers will share with us some insights about the plans to consolidate the achievements and bring them to the next level. Please welcome Alberto Garrido, professor at the UPM School for Agricultural Engineering and the coordinator of the ELISA Alliance. <laughs> FAU Vice President for Outreach and member of ELISA Governing Board, Kathleen Moseline. <laughs> and finally, the leader of Work Package 4, dedicated to the ELISA communities, Ike Trost, who is also the ELISA project manager of FAU. <laughs> Mr. Garrido, what upcoming milestones should we expect in the life of the ELISA Alliance? Thank you very much, uh, Rector Sigani, for, and everyone for being in this important celebration day of ELISA. Uh, we've already witnessed some achievements, uh, tangible results of our collaboration. ELISA is a durable and solid alliance. In the first two years, not even two years, because we will be turned on uh, November the 1st this year. This will be the moment will be two years old. So we are not even two years old yet. Teams formed by all our institutions have been working hard to co-create and lay the foundations of our alliances, building shared processes, systems, decision-making processes, frameworks. So in the first year, all our alliance have been laying the grounds from which all our activities, all our projects will start growing, scaling up, and becoming really a reality for our students, for our constituencies, for our regions, and for our, our university communities. We've seen already some of these tangible results, the communities. We've already granted credentials to students We've created a community platform. We've launched a joint call for communities activities that will be resolved in a few days and which will fund programs, activities, innovative ideas which will come true in the following 12 months 
proposed by communities of different countries, different uh, universities, united with a common definition and perception of problems, social problems. We are ready to, learn, to, 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 to prepare the next funding era, the four years plus two renovation of ELISA. This will be our second phase. And we are here in Budapest precisely to discuss how are we doing with ELISA at the moment? How do we perceive our achievements, our goals, our way to work, and most importantly, to prepare a vision, a common and shared vision to prepare our proposals for renewal of ELISA, which will be submitted to the European Commission uh, next year. So if we succeed in this renovation, then we will have six more years of life and ELISA will really become a much more solid alliance and we will be uh, impregnating all our life in our universities with ELISA opportunities for our students. Thank you, Mr. Garrido. European universities are pioneering initiatives where innovative management takes a central stage. Ms. Millsline, as an expert on the topic, how can ELISA and the ELISA communities become a model for innovative management and international cooperation? Thank you. It's great to be here today and it's great to be part of such a wonderful community. And you all have heard the word community, community, community in each and every statement. And you might wonder why we are so proud on this community statement that Eliza makes. For those who do research on communities, for sure we know that academia has always built on communities. Universities have built on, on communities, academics have worked even in the early days of universities as communities traveled to each other and tried to, to bring together their shared interest and build the new. Well, we also see that in, in recent years, the most innovative organizations on this planet drive innovation through communities. Why? What's new? And there is something new. Because as ELISA President Dale Martin already said, we bridge across international boundaries, we bridge interdisciplinary and uh, break the borders between disciplines. I think even more is happening because today we have the pleasure to have, as you said, a community platform. We can combine the real world with the online world. The collaboration doesn't stop after a meeting. Sometimes it really gets inspired through the meeting, then continues online until we can meet again. And that's the pleasure of having a connecting platform that helps us to bridge the real, the digital, the virtual world into work together like boundaryless across disciplines, across nationalities, but also across, and I think this is really the revolutionary part, across stakeholder groups. Students, scholars and staff, the core groups of our universities, work seamlessly together. And we all know universities, and we all know that usually Universities are very proud of academic freedom. But academic freedom is often the freedom of professors. The freedom of professors to start innovation, the freedom of professors to teach their ideas. But within our communities, we can bridge across stakeholders group and everyone, students, scholars, and our staff in the university administration equally can start communities they have to find people to follow their ideas. They have to find people to work with them. They have to find people to co-create and create the new and drive innovation. 
But I think that makes a real difference. We do not have to wait until our students become professors to drive the new. Students can start now, and you have seen it from those who took the credentials, you have so seen it from the statements. We all together want to drive innovation, we want to solve problems, as we also have heard from Fabio. And if you have been inspired today by the keynote of Claudio Fecho on tech diplomacy, and you feel this is an absolutely important, fascinating topic that needs more power behind, well, you would join a community. You would drive a community. You would help to make innovation happen. And I think this is the way how Elisa wants to create change makers, and I'm stealing the word with pride from Claudio Fecho, because what we want to create are change makers, and we want to be open for other stakeholders in our society, communities, and that's my final point, are also the windows to industry, the windows to society, the windows for others to participate in our initiative. So I'm totally proud to have communities, and I think uh, it's clear to all of us why we are so proud on that concept. Thank you, Ms. Moslein. We have already mentioned the first joint call for the ELISA community, which is a big step within the Alliance. Ms. Trost, can you tell us the details of such an important initiative and what has been the response of the ELISA community? Yeah, it would be my pleasure. First of all, also, thank you to BME for hosting us. Actually, my first time in Budapest. Really, really nice. I hope that many students also get the, the chance to, to come here. Um, well, the experience with the joint call was actually twofold for us. I would say on the one side it was internal, at the project management team. On the other side it was also an external experience when we will announce the results and also for the communities to answer to this call for projects. So first of all, we'll start with the internal perspective. So uh, some of the work package members are also sitting in the audience. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your contribution because doing, inventing a call is not an easy thing. So you have to decide on a budget, you have to decide on a goal, you have to decide on a target group and so on. So it was for us also a journey. I think we learned something. If we will repeat this, we will probably change something because we're also, of course, developing. Um, but I think it was a big success that we eventually could do it and that we had published our first call. Uh, secondly, I said there's an external or the participatory perspective on the topic, um, the communities. So overall, we received 46 proposals by 27 communities. At the moment, we have 34 communities. You can all find them on the platform. The um, address is communities.eliza.eu. Um, happy to share it also afterwards. Um, yeah, so the motto of ELISA is united in diversity, as many of you know, and I think this also fits to what was said before, because this is what we saw in the call when we reviewed the results. So on the one side, we had, um, we had proposals from all nine ELISA institutions in the leading function as well as in the co-organizational function and in the participatory function, which is, I think, quite nice. And then we had also proposals coming from professors, we had proposals coming from staff, we had proposals coming from students. So also here we had this diversity. Then if we take a look on the activities that were proposed, we have activities that take place completely online, we have activities that have a hybrid mode, so there's a offline and an online element. Then we have uh, activities that would totally take place in, in person. So at the end, we will have mobilities of staff, students, and academics, educators, researchers, which is also quite great and which also shows the diversity. Uh, last but not least, also discipline-wise, we have had activities that focus on medtech. We had activities that focus on architecture or agriculture. We had activities that focused on um, every kind of broad field of engineering, which is also great, I think. Also the combination with the social science. Um, yeah. So I was, was really happy to receive so many high quality uh, proposals. And last but not least, the results will be announced by email until Monday latest. Overall, as I said, we had 46 proposals. We have to exclude we had to exclude some of uh, some of them due to technical reasons, but I think this is also a usual 
thing going on in competitive calls. Um, yeah, but overall we have like a 50% funding rate of the proposals we can fund and all the budget that the nine universities allocated the call to the call, meaning the 300,000K will be spent for around about 20 activities in the call. So I think we can be really proud of that and I'm quite happy to see how it pays off the work. Also when I see the, the statements before I, I really got goosebumps because it really just shows we are reaching something, we are reaching people, we are getting somewhere. And yeah, I'll give it back to you. Just. Before closing this roundtable, are there any upcoming events or activities that you would like to remark? Yes, Blanca, yeah. <laughs> I'm very pleased. It's a privilege to announce that we will be holding the Lisa Days this year between the 10th of September of November and the 17th of November. We will be celebrating the Elisa Days. A full week of online and on-site events, workshops, conferences, and contests targeting our communities, targeting the general public, our constituents, our regions, and we will be commemorating the birth of the woman whose name is recalled every time we mention our alliance, Elisa Leonida Sanfrescu. And the, will, the, the week will also be an opportunity to out, outreach our programs and opportunities for our students, but also give visibility of our alliance to the general public. And also we will be launching the ELISA contest, the ELISA awards, recognizing those members of our communities that live along the, along the ELISA values and have made a contribution to promote these values and make uh, significant results in some areas of interest for our alliance and for our communities. So this will be also launched in a very short uh, period and we will be launching also the programs of the ELISA days. Remember the week from November the 10th to November the 17th. So please stay tuned to the program and participate in all these activities that we will be organizing. Thank you, Blanca. Thank you all for sharing this insightful information with us. We look forward to an autumn packed with activities that will let Eliza faculty, staff, and students engage and come together. Student mobility is one of the core elements of cooperation between Eliza partners. However, how can this short term mobility become a long term strategic partnership? To help us delve into this topic, we have our second keynote speaker, Mr. Andres Patarica. He is an electrical engineer and the founder of the Fault Tolerance System Research Group, Department of the Measurements and Information Systems at BME. He currently serves as the honorary chair of the Computer Science and Engineering Branch of the National Council of Student Research and is a member of the ELISA Evaluation Committee. Uh, many thanks uh, for the introduction and uh, please allow me to express my gratitude to talk to you. While Claudio gave an excellent overview from the top level, I try to introduce some ideas from 30 years of experience with student mobilities and my personal uh, relations and stays as visiting professor in Erlangen where I spent nearly one decade commuting between Budapest and Erlangen in Italy, in Pisa, Florence, and the good cooperation with Madrid in AIT Digital. So well, my, the title of my short talk is Visiting Students are Ambassadors of 
the university, it is rather simple. Students are products of our education. Whenever we send out a student, the partner university looks at him and measures, maybe intuitively, is he clever, does he have proper skills, and what can we do to make this entire ELISA movement more successful, we who are simply professors, educators, and the students themselves in the background. So I tried to collect some experiences, and we have now a wonderful ELISA framework, fellowships, uh, communities, and the framework as a result of a very professional work is there. What I try to address, small fragments, what can help to make this functioning on the long term. And in addition, I try to expose such benefits, what we can promote to those professors who are not directly involved into the organization, what are the motivational elements of this? When we look at a student, he brings quite a lot of knowledge in his bag. At first, he brings some soft skills, generally about the culture of the home country, what about teamwork and communities need this teamwork as an enabling factor. Uh, he has some hard skills, including technology foundations, science and technology foundations, and the best one in higher uh, semesters bring research skill like we, uh, many students by us participate in project works, some management capabilities and communication capabilities. And the big problem is that at first, we have to create a match between host and guest university. Each university has the freedom. We have excellent universities in the consortium. However, for an individual student, this match has to be helped. The second one is that after travel, he brings back a lot of experiences. And what I call the debriefing, is that simply we have to collect his experiences and evaluate an action plan, A for ELISA and B for the home university as well. So that is why I was very happy uh, to participate in the forthcoming evaluation committee. And here when I speak about a tutor, that is someone who will not instruct the student to do something abroad or not. He will give friendly advices as we have done in our, my research group for decades. And his rule is that after collecting the experiences during the preparatory and after mobility phase, he can generalize some experiences and use, for instance, in, maintain, in the maintenance process of his course of curriculum, look what are the differences and what are the gaps. In the preparatory phases, I told that some fitting should be done. So whenever the student comes to me prior uh, of a mobility and ask for an advice, we sit together, look at the target curriculum, and we find the gaps. Nowadays, uh, let's say for each topic, you can find something on the internet. So his travel preparations include, in addition to pack his bag, to look at some courses to uh, compensate the mismatch in the basics. And when he arrives and starts uh, his studies, then there, is, there are no time needed spent to, I don't understand what the professor in this foreign country is speaking about. He has the basics uh, for the rapid integration. And the second one, what includes here is the fitting of the background. And here the students at the host, uh, uh, at the target university can help a lot. If you 
uh, you are the uh, generation of, let's say, social media. If you set up a blog, what is important for the students, let's say, in Erlangen? And you publish it to the guest, it helps a lot. For instance, Erlangen is famous about uh, a city which has the largest network or the second largest network of bike roads. And if a stu Hungarian student arrives there and wants to buy a cheap bike, some advice on the internet, which is the primary source of information, would be beneficial. I would recommend let's go to a Fahrrad Versteigerung, an action of law, uh, found bikes, and such little actions help them to a seamless transition to a new environment and not to make them to a challenge. So I encourage each student group, open a blog somewhere. The universities don't need to be eligible of, of the content. It can be informal, where you can collect your advices, and even we encourage the students at the mobility to write their experiences there, and that will collect a knowledge base time gradually. Similarly, after coming home, I recommend that a tutor or some uh, a colleague uh, take, uh, makes an interview with them. What did you enjoy? What were your difficulties? And what could we do better at our home university? What did you lack? There were several such interviews which triggered actions by us. For instance, we adopted some elements from the Finnish education. So, here the tutor can help and can collect himself valuable information. Yes, we, we know that those are individual opinions and experiences, but they are signs of a potential to do. The next one is soft skills. Soft skills should start, for instance, by the etiquette, uh, a little primitive example. I hate it, but nowadays students try to speak to us, hello, and address us by our given names. My usual reply is that, look, you are at the generation of my oldest grandson, so let's remain by Mr. Professor or something similar. Uh, and I strongly disadvise to try it in Germany. Uh, so uh, these little soft skills elements I mentioned uh, should be uh, promoted, and that is an autonomous activity in my, in my view for students. Let's do it. Hard skills. In the case of hard skills, mismatch check is always something very useful for us as professionals. We see what is the other doing, what we are not doing in education, what are they doing better, and probably what are we doing uh, better. So that is extremely useful for, uh, for curriculum development. According to my own experience, such a preparation for a student in course selection abroad and so on takes less than one hour and gives five action items for, for me. So I recommend all the colleagues, and that is our task to promote Elisa in uh, the community. One very interesting point is how students participate in research activities, and that is a common point at the ordinary educational project works, uh, the disciplinary ones, and those, for those students who participate in interdisciplinary ones. In Hungary, we have a 70-year-long tradition for uh, student research societies. In Istanbul, uh, our university officially uh, offered to go along the lines and to organize such a research conference with this big tradition for the ELISA community. Me, as a member of uh, uh, the uh, uh, movement 
even in, uh, in this presidium, uh, I can assure that he, 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 it has a full support of the Hungarian uh, uh, movement. We can, and as, as it was offered, participate in the organization. And for the communities, that would mean that starting from the idea, team creation, work, they would reach that level, what means uh, communication to the wide public and entering the scientific life. That is something for the student, like a good international conference. In Hungary, the winners of this competitive conference usually publish their results in uh, good international uh, journals. For the tutor, having these times uh, brings uh, all the benefits related to internationalization. So, uh, uh, so we gradually develop good personal relations. And personal relations are the fabric of internationalization. So I saw quite a lot of very good European project preparatory events and so on, but the best ones are created by email and phone that, hey, I have here an opportunity. You remember we cooperated so well, let's try it once again. Uh, so, debriefing and evaluation, I guess, should be made an important part of our project. And I hope it's so that soon we will start within the evaluation committee to formalize this. Uh, one, something which is very important, when we collect the information, we should look at the institutional benefits of our home uh, university experiences are valuable, and we have to channelize the results into the different committees being in charge for education. Finally, my closing remarks. I guess we have a very promising pilot experiment here, and from the very first moment on, uh, we have to address a sustainable uh, cooperation. Fellowship is a one-time action. A series of fellowship is already a trigger of cooperation, and if ELISA will have a large basis in students and professors, then it will be long on long-term successful. The next uh, message is that good students are the best marketing means of the host institution. Communities uh, can create uh, a tradition for a scientific community at multiple levels because traditionally those students who uh, get involved into such international mobilities repeat it and frequently become to PhD students and staff members. And, and uh, that can take many, many forms, this freshly established contacts like joint projects, education, cooperation, research project. In our group, we have strategic uh, partnership with numerous uh, uh, universities. I wrote only early and greet N of the students, we cannot count anymore how many students we sent. All of the permanent staff in, my, in our research group spent a longer time at some partner universities. So they are familiar with the others and they are familiar with, with different European systems. I learned quite a lot from Italy, Germany uh, and uh, other countries. What is the level what we can reach? And that is 30 years perspective. Our small research group is proud that we had proposed and the university accepted to distinguish the professors for, uh, in addition to their scientific achievements, for the cooperation, one from Erlangen, he's now retired, 
The other one is active, starting from Knudze to the University of Florence. Yesterday, he was my private guest independently of ELISA. We tried to count the number of student exchanges and the number of joint European projects. We failed. I hope it's so that this failure will be repeated by the ELISA, ELISA community. And if we are finished, that we cannot count in 10 to 15 years perspective, how many student exchanges, how uh, many staff exchanges, and how many joint projects did we reach, then ELISA serves its purpose. Thanks for that, your attention. Thank you, Mr. Patoritza, for this inspiring lecture. Now it is time to wrap up this celebration event by giving voice to the people who give a meaning to ELISA and European universities, the students. Please welcome back Ben Daguz Pop, also a key member of the ELISA Student Council. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate those uh, receiving their ELISA credentials today. Uh, it is an honor to have received uh, the ELISA credentials on behalf of the students of BME and the students of the Alliance. It is wonderful to see the progress uh, of the Alliance and the, the achievements that the students uh, have made. I speak for myself and the ELISA Student Council uh, when I say that we believe in the idea of European education. We believe in the idea to reform the engineering education in a more international, interdisciplinary, sustainable, inclusive and equitable way. As ELISA Student Council, we represent more than 180,000 students within the Alliance. We, with the students, develop ideas for ELISA, give feedback, and contribute to the different boards of the Alliance. The Student Council, in the Student Council, we exchange our ideas, opinions from the different universities, we learn by each other, and build up a common student understanding for ELISA and the future of European education. Our mission is to represent the students. The student needs even better within the Alliance. Our mission is to develop student engagement further and exchange possibilities and start a new era of European education. Students gain a broad skill set and mindset, learn the different teaching and education methods, and join courses and join degrees in ELISA. The possibility of gaining funding by ELISA is unique for students. ELISA is a great opportunity for all, for all of them. ELISA is special and is also a special and unique program. It is great that it focuses on students, their needs, and their professional, academic, and personal growth. Its close attention to the Sustainable Development Goals is also quite unique. ELISA brings a huge and strong network and it offers more opportunities than other networks or Erasmus programs. The ELISA network, moreover, is a very strong network and we already feel like the nine universities are growing together. In terms of, in terms of academic learning, students, can see different teaching and learning styles, different professors, countries, and cultures. They can learn different goal, goals, different good practices for their own careers. ELISA is part of future education, which is more personalized, digital, and interdisciplinary. Student view is important and worth a lot. While the student view is rather unimportant at the level of most institutions, we appreciate the relevance and involvement of students in ELISA. 
For the future development of European education, this democratic understanding of education is a game changer. Our aim as the Student Council for the next academic year is having local student groups at each institution. We also aim to grow the number of exchanges, activities and events with set uh, groups. Altogether, ELISA brings Europe closer together and it can be a real game changer in terms of European education, stability of democracies, collaboration and sustainability. And most importantly, we students are role, mod role models for society and together we can create an impact. Thank you. Thank you, Ben de Goos, for your words and for closing today's event. Now we have come to an end, and I would like to encourage you to keep exploring what ELISA and ELISA community have to offer. Visit ELISA website, follow ELISA on social media, and register for the ELISA newsletter. I hope you enjoyed and felt inspired by our keynote speakers and panelists. Thank you for joining us on site and via streaming, and have a nice day. <laughs>